Tonight on EWTN Live, we'll discuss the differences between saints and scoundrels. And we'll go beyond those labels to look at two important people behind them and their motivations. So please stay with us. I'm Father Mitch Packer. Welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all over the world. And our guest tonight is the host of EWTN's very popular, because it's very wonderful, television series called Saints vs. Scoundrels. It's a tough choice for me, uh, <laughs> where I want to be. But, but our guest presents the lives of some of the most influential and interesting figures from throughout history in a unique time warp of good and bad, old and new. And when he's not in front of a camera here at EWTN working very hard on this series, he's in front of a classroom at Franciscan University of Steubenville, where he teaches political science. Or he's in front of a computer writing another interesting book, which he's done plenty of. I'll talk about one of my favorites that I'm rereading. Uh, He's a senior fellow with the Veritas Center for Ethics and Public Life. So please welcome my friend, Dr. Benjamin Weicker. Good to see you. Yeah, good to be back. Oh, it's good to be. You know, one, one of the things I, I've loved is reading your books because you do a variety of really interesting uh, topics. Um, you know, I was, mentioned I'm um, reading Politicizing the Bible again, um, going over some of that for deeper study. And it's got so much in it. Mm -hmm. But also your book on Darwin and uh, just wonderful, wonderful insights into the architects of the culture of death. You worked on that book. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, and you like, to, you seem to be able to work well with others. You can work <laughs> with other authors. Too. Yeah. Yes. That's nice. Plays well with others. Get you a t-shirt. Yeah. The, <laughs> but not always the case with academics. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, it's easy for us to get into our little worlds. But you're doing something very important with the Saints and Scoundrels series, mm -hmm. where you bring the different ways, not only understanding some of the essential characters that fashioned our world, sometimes really for the worse, mm -hmm. other times for the better. And having them enter into a dialogue and thinking through the issues. They're not ranting and raving. Mm -hmm. And you haven't done anything on Congress at all yet, have you? <laughs> well, well no, that's no, a no, possibility, no. yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> that wouldn't be fun. No. Uh, what you want to do is th this material on where a dialogue of thinking through the issues. Yeah. And that's what I love about this series. Now, you're back again doing a continuation of the series. Mm -hmm. Who do you have in your series this time? Well, we not only have them in our series, we have them in our audience uh, tonight. Uh, so we have Margaret Sanger. Yes. And uh, she's our scoundrel. Yes. And then we have uh, Pope Paul VI. And he's our saint, or he's going to be a saint. No, right? Yeah. He's, he's venerable right now, right? Uh, no, he's blessed. He's blessed. Yeah. Okay, that's wonderful. So we uh, we are very happy to do that, and they, it's a very exciting show because, again, we're not just looking at abstract arguments; we're looking at their real lives. Yes. And what would it be like if they could meet? If that's, they could meet. That's part of the genius of your yeah. writing style in general. You look at the lives of individuals mm -hmm. and see that their ideas come from a context. Yeah. Um, you know, and as you work with actors, we have a couple of the actors here, but there's some fun moments that you have with the series. We want to take a look at a clip oh, that okay. you did uh, where you meet St. Francis of Assisi for the first time. Let's take a look I, at I can it. look at that? Okay.
This is just not right, St. Francis. I can't sit here while a saint scrubs my floor, for heaven's sakes. Where would you like to sit? That's not the point. The point is that you're a saint cleaning my office. As I said, I do not allow any of my brothers, and least of all myself, to beg for our food, except under absolute necessity. We are to labor for our bread, just as St. Paul did. But please, I beg you again, for the love of God and His Holy Mother, do not call me a saint. I am the poorest of sinners. But I can't just stand here while you're scrubbing my floor. You're right again. Might I graciously ask you to move over there and have a seat? I would like to clean your... My what? My desk. So now he wants to clean my desk. Oh, I guess it hasn't been cleaned for about a year. Does St. Francis hire out? I mean, my desk is a mess. <laughs> <laughs> really. he, or if you feed him. Yeah, that yeah. was the thing. Now, that, that was I, bringing I in can a... I can handle that. It, well, that was a hamburger. That yeah. was bringing the little sack. And, right. and the reason is we're trying to teach people about the real saint. So the real St. Francis is not just a little garden gnome uh, that begs. You know, he, he actually did want his brothers to work for whatever they were getting. Yeah. And so that's why I have right away, he's scrubbing my office. But he also didn't have a problem with eating meat. He's not just making happy with the birds and, oh, you know, just a oh. little cabbage here and there. He ate meat. In fact, he demanded that some of his uh, uh, friars ate meat, too, when others were trying to, uh, you know, go too far and make them fast. You can't have meat. He said, you eat meat yep. as a command. So mm -hmm. we have St. Francis digging into this big hamburger to make a point. He did eat meat. <sighs> I like him better all the time. Yeah, so, well, he didn't <laughs> shoot it. <laughs> the, uh, th this is, uh, yeah, it's important to, to, to see the real characters. It, but this season, you're going to be dealing with two characters of, you know, within my lifetime mm -hmm. uh, who were significant in my life. One I didn't know anything about. I never heard of her in, um, in my circles. The other, very much so, I invited him to my ordination, in fact. Uh, you're dealing with uh, Margaret Sanger, mm -hmm. whom I did not know, and Pope Paul VI, uh, who I also did not know. But again, I sent him an invitation to my ordination. I would have picked him up at the airport if he needed <laughs> a ride, too, but he sent a very nice card back. Um, now, why are you dealing with those two? Well, I'm... Uh, and pairing the those two up, and they're both... Important characters. Why would you pair them up? We've got um, uh, Margaret Sanger. Of course, she's the foundress of Planned Parenthood, and she was the big, you know, pusher uh, of birth control. Mm -hmm. uh, and unbeknownst to m most people, she was also pushing it for eugenics purposes. What's eugenics? What do well, you mean? In, uh, eugenics is something that really spun off Darwin. Mm -hmm. That is, if you believe that uh, human beings are no different from other animals, and you breed good traits from animals that you like and you get rid of the ones that don't match yeah, up to what you want. His principle for evolution yeah. was survival of survival the fittest. fittest. And, so uh, you, when with animals, we, we breed what we think are the most fit for exactly, our purposes. Exactly. And he said, well, why don't, and you know, Darwin uh, did actually assert that in his Descent of Man, that, you know, we need to breed better people and let the lesser be weeded out. So, yeah, and, and it's good for folks to know that by that, he also meant breeding out people of, uh, from Africa and yes. African origin. Yeah. And he talks yeah. about them as an inferior breed. Absolutely. If you, if you look, read his Descent of Man, which I rec not, recommend for everyone to read this, because you, some of those passages you think, oh, my gosh, you know, did you really say that? <laughs> so, you know, breeding out entire races that are going to be in one way uh, inferior to, to uh, the Caucasian. I mean, he just says that. Yeah. Uh, and Margaret he Sanger... Called, he said they're like an inferior breed of cattle in yeah, Africa. Yeah, That's yeah. his term. They're, they're, they're a lesser species, and so you're, you're going to eliminate them through natural selection. 
and uh, why not apply this to, to human breeding? In other words, you could just let it happen by nature, uh, or, you could, uh, or you could take control of the reins and breed the best and get rid of the worst. Well, that's where Margaret Sanger came in. Her original reason for pushing birth control was as a way to limit the breeding of the unfit. She called them imbeciles, morons, uh, just you know, horrible names in her book, Pivot of Civilization. Uh, all of which to say these people sh would be better off if they had not been born, but they're born now, but at least don't let them breed. And so that's why the birth control uh, clinics go to neighborhoods where she didn't want those people populating the planet. And by planet. imbeciles and idiots, et cetera, she meant people from Eastern Europe, people from Southern Europe, Jewish people, uh, Hispanic people, and especially like Darwin. Yeah. She was strongly against blacks breeding. She worked hard from late 30s and 40s mm. to get uh, ministers involved in helping to stop the breeding of black blacks. Again, breeding is what I talk about when I'm dealing with breeding cattle. Yeah, well, you're seeing human animal. beings as an animal, and you start talking about them like you talk about animals. And so for her, it wasn't just, you know, here are the inferior races, it's, if you don't make it on the IQ test, she was a big believer in the IQ test, which actually has eugenic origins too. Mm -hmm. How do you figure out who makes the cut? Mm -hmm. That was the IQ test, and she believed that pretty much 50% of the population would have been better off not to have graced the planet. And so, and she really meant that. And she said, oh, well, you know, she's not active extermination. She never says that. But that's what the birth control was for. And, and she was not even in favor of abortion. Not early yeah. on. No, early no, on. no. Yeah. Uh, the, the abortion uh, program for Planned Parenthood came with her successor mm. who ran Planned Parenthood. She wasn't big on abortion, but, you know, preventing the breeding of blacks, Jews, Hispanics, East Europeans, Southern Europeans, etc. Yeah. That was what you want to do with uh, birth control. Yeah, and then we have on the other side, we have Pope Paul VI, and of course everybody remembers him for Humana Vitae. That's the, popular, that's the, the, the encyclical where the, uh, the church definitively restates its position that it's had since the beginning. We're not going to accept the pill. We're not going to accept contraception. It goes against our teaching for almost 2,000 years. And uh, everyone, of course, think, you know, what a horrible person. How could he do this? Well, at the very same time, you know, somebody like Margaret Sanger is using birth control to eliminate people. And, uh, on racist basis. On racist basis and intelligence basis. On, uh, you know, uh, uh, she was really, if you read her Pivot of Civilization, it's language that you think you want to associate with the Nazis. Well, wait a minute. Did she not herself have... You know, send members of Planned Parenthood to consult with the Nazis well, uh, in we, the mid in '35 or so. Well, here's the interesting thing: uh, people don't know this, but the eugenics societies were all over America, all over Britain, all over France, not just Germany. Mm -hmm. And so, in that sense, you say Margaret Sanger is just one among a herd of people. Speaking of herds, uh, who wanted to take evolution into their own hands. And so that Germany, England, France, America connection was already well established by the end of the 1800s. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's big build up. This is what all the scientists were doing. This wasn't just, you know, far out wackos in the, you know, in brown shirts. This was people at top universities in Germany and America. This is where all the big money was, the Rockefeller Foundation. So the Rock Rockefeller yeah. Foundation helped to finance this. It's absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and, and, and all aspects and, of it. And there were, uh, because we still see Ford Foundation Ford and Foundation, other Rocker, groups yes, absolutely. that, the, that the, the very, very wealthy are, were, were interested in eliminating those who were inferior to them. Yes, oh, I, or they perceived them to be inferior anyway. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, without that big money, uh, these, they wouldn't have had nearly this much effect. All, all the population control programs... Uh, from Planned Parenthood, all the international programs, the pushing of uh, not only birth control, but then Planned Parenthood picked up on gender selection abortions. 
a, a lot of people don't know that. That's the thing that it was, it was beyond what Margaret Sanger did, but it's in continuity with it. They figured out if you did gender selection abortions, that's how you reduce the population the quickest. And so Planned Parenthood International pushed that out there, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. They were behind the world population reduction push. So an example of that would be, two, the, the two greatest examples of that would be India yes. and China. And China, yes. Where in each one of those countries, there are already over 40 million men in each place. I think in India, it's 46 million men for whom there is yeah. no woman to marry. Yeah. And there will not be one. The, there will the, not. the girls were mm. aborted and the the boys are there and the result of that is a huge increase of sexual slavery I was gonna, yes, to deal yes, with that so yeah, that yeah. it's not only mm. the result of you know, uh, that, that there aren't people to marry and a huge decline in population growth mm -hmm. it's, it's negative growth yeah. but also to gratify men uh, they, the sex slavery ish, uh, industry is enormous yeah, it in is, China. It is enormous. It's actually enormous all over that whole area because what happens was the people at the top, okay, they're, they're not having daughters. They're only having sons. Well, they need some daughters. How are you going to get those daughter-in-laws? They actually, in some cases, steal them from other countries in mm -hmm. villages in some of those areas in, in, uh, way in the outback of China and some of the other um, Pacific Rim areas, they yeah, actually, exactly. you can't, you don't want to take your, Philippines, you don't want to take your daughter out in a baby carriage because they will steal at that age. Yep. That's how bad it is. And, uh, and, and again, this is in continuity with what Margaret Sanger was trying to do because it isn't just she was trying to cut down on those, the undesirables, as she called them, the feeble minded, but also uh, on population as such. She, she bit into the population movement too. We need to reduce the population. Well, whose population? We know who's those guys. Yeah. Not the, the not the white people. The Indian in India. Not but, the Chinese. Not us. But in reality, it's the the greatest decline in birth rate has been among the industrialized yes. people. Yeah. Russia is oh, yes, Russia. declining in population by one million a year mm -hmm. between. Uh, 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 I think their abortion rate is 60 percent. At least, yeah. Of all At least. children conceived, 60 mm -hmm. percent are aborted, which also happens to be the same rate of abortion of all conceived children in New York City <laughs> and Washington D.C. Yeah, and that's not a surprise. Uh, it, it, and even in the year Roe v. Wade, the first year after we passed Roe v. Wade, I think uh, at that time Russia was eight million a year. In abortions you know ours is horrifying we're horrified by 1.5 but they were 8 million at that point I mean it gets pretty bad when back you know when they pushed uh, uh, abortion when communism first came in in Russia they had to actually reverse policies for a while because their decline in population and then Khrushchev put it back again yep. and said so allowed abortion again because they thought well this is progress you know this is this is uh, against the Catholic Church this is against Christianity so abortion is good they're also, killing themselves. Also, um, you know, the, the, the famous Marx and Engels who wrote yes, yeah. together. Yeah. Engels was a big promoter. Uh, as a matter of fact, he's considered, ironically, the father of modern feminism. <laughs> and yeah. one of the uh, yeah. points that he was making was women have to be free of childbirth and child rearing. So he would also be a promoter of that. And that was part of... Uh, uh, Marx and Engels uh, thought. And that's not, that's not some academic thing sitting out there. That, that influenced uh, the intelligentsia all over Europe and America. Uh, people don't know uh, somebody like Betty Friedan, who wrote The Feminine Mystique. Now, that brought it to America. She was actually a deep dish Marxist, following upon Engels' view that this is the final liberation of women. They need to get out. They're like the proletariat in the household. If you're a housewife, you're like one of the proletariat. Remember Betty Friedan and the feminist oh, mystique yeah. came in and said, oh, you women are slaves in your home. You're bored. You're taking drugs. You need to rise up, throw yeah. off your chains, get a job as a banker. And it, but it's not only Russia with the influence of Marx and Engels' thought mm. that's going down, but 
all of Western oh. Europe. In fact, yeah, we, Italy, could say Germany, in, yeah. we could say in general, the Caucasian race is well on its way to self-extermination or extinction. Yeah. And in Japan, it's the same. In Japan, They're yes. decline, They admit to declining by 100,000 a year, but apparently it's more than that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, and they don't take outsiders, for, you know, people from other countries, yeah. to become citizens. So it's, it's become, and the birth rate is still low. I mean, the, the, the very people that they wanted to not make themselves extinct, not breed themselves out of existence are the ones doing it first. Yeah, yeah, it's the exact opposite effect that I guess Darwin was searching for, but in, in one way we can say, well, you know, serves you right, uh, you know, to, to put this program in, in, uh, uh, in, in, try to put it into effect. I mean, it was a horrible thing. You know, Darwin himself had a lot of kids. Interesting enough, he followed it, it, his own program, right? Yeah, but he, but he they, were they were all sickly. Yeah. <laughs> they were all sickly, and this is a horrible thing to say, but Darwin himself, shouldn't have survived. He was sick, his wife was sick. Sadly enough, I think three of his 10 children died because they were sick. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they, they, so- They just didn't have a strong constitution. They did not have a strong constitution, but he never applied. mentioned that, he never applied it to himself. Right. You know, Thanks that's kind of strange. God for his kids and all, but you know, the, um, you know, it, this is one of the things that we have to deal with with modern uh, theories. Yes that one of the most important principles I've learned over the years is you can always undo modern silly thought by taking their theory but making them apply it to themselves. Yes, yes. That always undoes their thought. Yeah. In, and this is an example of that. Now, in the face of this ideology that Margaret Sanger, right? and again, it I'm, I'm bothers my mind how many politicians uh, I know are proud of the Margaret Sanger Award and supported. You were mentioning Planned Hillary Clinton, Parent. I assume. Uh, she just received that. Yeah, she, she received it. She's won. Um, and that would be like I I accepting the uh, General Bedford uh, <laughs> Award for, he's the founder of the Ku Klux Klan. Yeah, yeah. Would, you, would you accept that? Yeah. yeah. I hope not. Well, and this is that one, you're forced. Absolutely, and that's one of the reasons that I, I, I always have everyone I can read Margaret Sanger's Pivot of Civilization and why you can't find it on Planned Parenthood's website. Notice they don't push her works. No. You say, why well, don't you? Oh, gosh, you'd think you would want them. She wrote so many things. She was so proud of them because when you read them, your hair stands on end. Yep. And say, oh, well, she's just a woman of her times. Well, it doesn't seem like what she thought. I mean, she said that stuff very boldly, and she meant it. And the policies that they followed through make mm -hmm. perfect sense of what you know, what she she was advocating. Yeah. I mean, prenatal screening and the, the extermination of what you think is unfit. Why is that different from you know just hardcore eugenics yeah. uh, that the Nazis carried out? You're doing the same thing. It's not right. any less or more humane. Now, in contrast, though, you pit her <laughs> up against Pope Paul VI. Pope Paul VI. And nice. now just to, so for truth in advertising, I was just about to enter the novitiate with uh, just over uh, about four weeks after Humane Vitae, less than four weeks after it, uh, that came out. 1968. 1968, 1968. July of 1968. There you go, yeah. And I entered the uh, novitiate in August of 68. And it was immediately met with turmoil. I mean, uh, Father Charles Curran mm. and others were just in the, this turmoil. And I've heard some people describe the... Um, uh, the issuance of the Humanae Vitae as being like the storming of the Bastille for progressive Catholic movement, that this was the event, you know, because every revolution needs a key event that just gets everybody, yeah. whether it's the storming of the Bastille or defending the Alamo or the Boston Tea Party, 
uh, the, instead of Boston. Or the defenestration of Prague, one of my uh, favorites. There, there you go. <laughs> uh, so it's, um, you know, the throwing out the tea bags and getting the condoms are put parallel to each other here in the revolutions. I was trying to work through that vision. I'm going to. Yeah, I don't think. <laughs> don't do that, no. <laughs> but, it, but that's, it, yeah, it yeah. charged up yeah, a, yeah. a major revolt yeah. and yeah. changed. You know, Father Curran and others like him had been very against birth control just in 65 or so, yeah. 66. They, were, they taught against it. I have priest friends who were in Curran's class yeah, yeah. And, also, and some of the other priests that were the leaders. Um, uh, McCormick, uh, McCormick, Father Richard McCormick, Richard McCormick the Jesuit. Yeah, yeah. Some of the, he was adamantly against it. And then by this Switch. point, they lead a revolution. Uh, you know, against the church's teaching. How does Paul the Sixth now fare? Uh, prophet, prophet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, uh, when you read him, you read. Uh, you know, he's he's very careful in his analysis. You know, why are people asking for this? Okay, let's look at it more deeply. And he realizes that if you sever procreation from sexual activity. You break that union. Procreation's gonna go wild, and so will sexual activity. So what have we had since then? People in test tubes doing weird things, trying to you know, tease uh, uh, you know, sperm cells and, and eggs out of you know, uh, uh, some kind of cells in the body, uh, from, from impregnating people with, with all these weird, anything but just good old fashioned natural way to have children. It's all untethered. It has no connection with the human anymore. And it's only going to get worse. So notice that went wild. And then sexuality went wild. So they're bo they both uh, have, have, have been cut loose from any mooring at all. There's no natural foundation for either one. And uh, I, I think that if he could have seen how bad it would be getting, mm -hmm. that I, I don't know whether he, you know, he would have had a heart attack. I mean, it's, it's way worse than his prophecies. His prophecies are mild. Um, but he was very, he was dead on accurate. If you break this link, which is essential to the natural law, you will have no control over uh, sexuality, you will have no limit, or how you try to bring children into being. And he was dead right on both. Technology's gone wild. Sexuality's gone wild. And just to, to, to sense, give a sense of the, how it's expanded, uh, the Center for Disease Control, this is our federal government, yeah. Uh, agency for seeing the development of diseases and, and various issues. Mm. They did charts and they s point out that the, in the curve, they, they, they traced the sale of uh, condoms and the pill uh, from 1970, 71 or so. Mm. And it goes fairly steeply up. But what they pointed out is that the curve for increasing abortion is the same. It follows it, yes. The yeah. curve for increasing uh, uh, children out of wedlock follows the same curve. And the, the chart for the increase of sexually transmitted diseases follows the same curve. In other words, it becomes clear that with more use of the pill and the condom and other birth control devices. The more it's used, the more out of wedlock childbirth, sexual yeah. diseases, and abortion go up. And divorce. And well, divorce. And they, di they didn't. Yeah. They didn't include that because yeah. that wasn't something that but they were true. measuring. Yeah, you, but you, that's you, also gone up too. And and you can put in a, a lot of other things in case the doom isn't bad enough. Uh, the use of pornography. No. All those things go up. So that in yeah. 1940 in this country, it was 4% of children were born out of wedlock. Mm -hmm. Right now, it just went up again yeah, since, the, 19, yeah. uh, since mm -hmm. the 2010 census. Mm -hmm. It's now 52% of all children, more than half of all children, are born out of wedlock. And even With incredible instability yes. of poverty yes. and yeah. other disorders that, that come yeah. along uh, socially. Yeah. Uh, increasing with it. And this yeah, is. Yeah, absolutely. So he was prophetic. Yes. 
about yeah. what was going on. And people were laughing at him. Oh, well, that's never going to happen. Oh, what happened? I remember it the, happened. The, the absurd, yeah. how absurd he seemed. Yeah. Oh, what are you wait, raving your arm for? That's never going to happen. I remember then agreeing with him. But I said, wow, did you overstate this? Oh. He had, there was no way to tell how much he had understated. That was going to say, he, he, was, he, uh, he understated. If, if he literally could have gone 50 years in advance and said, this is what's going to happen, they would have put him in an asylum. Yep. Well, look, we got to take a break. We're all over time here. Um, you know, Dr. Weicker has a blog you can go to. Um, it's called Deeper Than That. You just go to benweicker.com. Ben, excuse me, Benjamin Weicker, right? BenjaminWeicker.com. And you can find out there. And we'll come back with your questions and comments. So please stay with us. Right. Uh, again, we want to get to your questions in just a minute here. But I uh, just also want to mention, you know, Dr. Weicker's books, one of which is Politicizing the Bible. Great book, uh, co-authored with our mutual friend, Dr. Scott Hahn. Uh, you can get that as number uh, item number 9034. Or also Answering the New Atheism. Very important work. Uh, it's also That's item number... 18487. Uh, both of them are available at EWTNRC.com. That's EWTN's religious catalog. EWTNRC.com or 1 800 854 6316. And get those. I, I guess the Dar they might have the Darwin book over there too. If they, I, I don't know. I, I hope they do. Either, but if they, Let's get them to have it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a great book. <laughs> um, all right. You ready for some questions? I'm ready. Let's get you. We're going to start off away. with a caller. Oh, okay. Hello, Michael. Hello, Padre. How are you? Fine, thanks. Where are you calling from? Goshen, Ohio. I was over at your St. Catherine Siena um, retreat uh, oh, yeah. September over a year ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. good. And what is your comment or question? Well, being a Catholic father of 10. 10. One wife. <laughs> God bless her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> A Job family, seven sons, three daughters. Yeah. And uh, last night I read on the internet that uh, Bill Nye, the science guy, is on a show called Bill Nye Save the World, and asked a question to the people there: if people with "quote unquote" excess children should should be penalized. And I just wanted to go ahead and try to get some feedback on that. So, um, I, uh, you're in favor of the penalization? Oh, heavens no. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so, not with 10 kids. I just didn't know how you define too many kids. So, uh, so Bill, Nye, who is this Bill Nye? I don't know him. Well, um, now I'm going to try to be charitable and polite, at least for a little I, bit. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Nah, never mind. I'll just say, tell the truth. Um, he is a very popular uh, science person. He himself, as I understand it, does not have a science degree. But he's done a popular show on, um, I'm not sure which network, so he's, he's, he's got a fairly large audience. He does wacky things. But he's also a, a, a sort of kind of a rabid on the left, my gosh, we need to uh, reduce the population. Uh, it's horrible to overbreed. Humans are a bad idea anyway, except for, of course, him and his friends. Uh, so he is going to be in favor of, uh, I assume, rather radical measures uh, I'm sure he's linked into the global warming 
uh, uh, notions, which again is often just a couch way to do, uh, you know, we need to reduce the population. Mm -hmm. So when they say, I want to reduce the carbon footprint, they want to actually reduce the feet that are making them. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he would agree to say, yes, we need to penalize because you see uh, things coming from the left uh, that even call from the radical, radical left for the extermination of people. Yeah. And, and in fact, uh, many people don't know this, it was the Sierra Club that originally funded the efforts to reduce population through uh, not just birth control, but through gender-selected abortions. So there's this, this heavy the Sierra aspect. Sierra Club? Yeah, they, they actually did some... I thought that was sort of a nature... Nature, yeah. It's just we're for butterflies and birds. Yeah, but they've yeah. done some... They, they were actually but the people bees that, and birds they don't yeah, bees like. Bees and birds they don't like. Well, they they funded uh, the original population bomb book, and that ah, well, that was by, by Ehrlich. Yeah, that was that was a, a concerted effort to say, oh my gosh, we're going to all die. Do anything drastic to reduce population. You can see how that might fit with Humana Vitae. You know, you've got you've got the Pope saying, uh, you know, you can't do this, and at the very same time, even before that, we need to reduce the population actively go in and reduce it. Yeah, because that book came out just a Just a little, yeah, two? it was right then. Uh, uh, right maybe then. the same year, I don't remember the year that Ehrlich published that, but it was right around the time of Humanae yeah, Vitae. Yeah, right, right around the time of Humanae Vitae. You'd almost get a sense that this was a preemptive strike yeah. against Paul yeah. VI. It, exactly, and it had that effect because the media took it up. And so Bill Nye and the media is still, he's continuing that, push and there's a connection between the eugenics folks and then later on the population control folks and the global warming. Mm -hmm. You have to have that aspect of the global warming. We can look at the science of it. I look at, it, at the science of it in, in, in a book. You don't have to be a global warming doubter. It's a question of what are you doing with what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Are you saying we need to take care of global warming? Or are you saying what we need to take care of is too many human beings? And so you find that uh, um, among the left saying, yeah, I think we start need to take measures to reduce populations. Well, we've done it in other countries. We've exported abortion. And a lot of people don't know this. The United States was exporting abortion before Roe v. Wade mm. as a way to cut down population in communist countries. Or ones that we thought would be dominated by communism. We went in there and like in Korea, uh, and Japan was another one, but also in China, trying to say, reduce your populations. Uh, that way you'll be more prosperous. You'll be less likely to have revolutions. That was Margaret Sanger's That's uh, Margaret plan Sanger. to, for yeah. African-Americans. Yeah, she was, she was linked into that movement, and Planned Parenthood just, it just glided after her death. She died before Humana Vita came out, uh, like in 66, uh, but, but the, the full continuity of what uh, she was trying to achieve is also a uh, champion like people like Bill Nye. And I don't know what the details of it would be, but I know Richard Dawkins has gone on record saying, you know, the whole eugenics thing, it's not that bad. You got to think about it. Okay, well, what about the Nazis? Well, you know, it has a bad odor from that, but the basic idea yeah, of it. Yeah, the odor of Say, wait a second. Flesh. The ba yeah, the basic idea of that is to eliminate people you don't think should be able, have ever been born. You know, that's a good idea. So it wouldn't surprise me that he was doing that. And it wouldn't surprise me that the media pushed and made a star out of somebody that did that. It, as I understand it, he does not have a science degree. Mm -hmm. I'd have to check on that, but, yeah. but he's not actually a scientist. Yeah. And it's, you know, this is, uh, you know, the, the federal government, John F. Kennedy, yeah. had tied contraception to foreign aid. Yes. Uh, Mr. Clinton tied this, this very strongly. Yes. Um, you know, Mr. Bush did not he change that by executive order, but certainly President Obama, you know, insist, pushed, again. pushed yeah. very hard again yeah. in Africa and Latin America. And that's not a new policy. It actually no. went back to Dwight Eisenhower, believe it or not. Eisenhower did Eisenhower too. Eisenhower did too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had, there were these I deep knew, connections. I knew about Kennedy and them, but I didn't realize yeah. it going back to They're Eisenhower. They're going back to Eisenhower because they were, they were thinking you're going to have the domino effect of communist countries. Why? Because you got a lot of poor there. How do you take care of a lot of the poor? You take care of them, period. Would that, that have been something that Nixon also did? They, they all bought into it, yeah. It yeah, was Republicans well. and Democrats, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, the George Bush Sr. actually wrote a foreword to uh, a book that uh, advocated gender selection abortion. People mm -hmm. don't know that because it's the 
fastest, most effective way to reduce a country's population. You yeah. take out the women. That, that just has a geometric decrease effect on it, as countries that have done that now are finding out. Yep. Yes. Yep. So it's, it's, uh, it, it's bipartisan badness. It isn't yeah. just Democrats, it's actually Republicans as okay. well. Okay. Yeah, that, that's important to note. Yes. That uh, people in our country of both parties have to stay alert to what your party platforms and what the governments you vote in are doing so mm -hmm. that we can stand up against them yes. and be very strong on that. We have a question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? I'm from New Jersey. Great. Good to have you here. What is your question? Uh, the church has done some remarkable teachings and, and writings in theology of the body and humanity vitae. Um, besides just private seminars that we see from time to time, it seems to me that, that that's one of the greatest assets I think the church has relative to the, not only the, what the church teaches, but more importantly, why the church teaches what it teaches. You know, we don't seem to hear that a lot from the pulpit. And I, I don't know if that's a problem with formation within seminaries, but I want to see if you could just comment on that topic in seminary development. Let me just ask you this without, I don't want any names or anything, but <laughs> how old is your priest? Uh, well, we go to some various parishes, but generally in the uh, 50s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they wouldn't have heard that. Mm. You know, the, the guys uh, in the 40s may have started, but um, guys in their 50s and older, uh, we were more influenced in our seminary training by Richard McCormick and uh, Charles Curran. Father Charles Curran yeah. and them. So, that, so my, my generation didn't hear much about that. Um, but what do you see going on among young people today, say, at the yeah, university? I, we have Franciscan university. university, yes. They, they do learn the theology of the body um, uh, and uh, in more than one class. Mm -hmm. uh, so they learn very deeply, uh, not just about, hey, don't do that. I think we're getting over the, hey, don't do that teaching, but this is the beauty of what it means to be a male and a female created in the image of God designed literally created for this union called marriage where you have this full complementarity of body and soul that makes sense of uh, our sexuality on the deepest level especially as an antidote to the 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 self extermination the destruction of sexuality we see around us so i i do believe there's a lot of hope in as you say in the younger folks that have mm -hmm. come through mm -hmm. It, I think it took a while to get uh, John St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body translated into an easier medium. It, it was a little rough to it's, get through it's, by it's itself. It's not easy, and yeah. also, yeah, and you have to bring the hay down so the goats can get it. That, yeah, that's he, that's, he forked it up high, uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, but th there have been a lot of people that have been working on that. And it would be very good if it were uh, taught more clearly uh, to the laity on a more regular basis because they're confused. They're not rejecting the church teaching. It's, they really haven't had it. Well, yet. and and again, the, the the guys my age, yeah. you know, don't have a background in theology of the body quite mm -hmm. typically, mm -hmm. and uh, we just didn't, didn't didn't exist. And we were taught that well, contraception is up to your own conscience. Uh, not all of us bought into that, but. Uh, and some of us got in trouble for not buying into that. But uh, the um, reality is um, today it is being taught. As a matter of fact, my uh, very close friend here in town sends his daughter to a school run by the Nashville Dominican Sisters. Oh, good, good. And the sisters are teaching theology of the body mm -hmm. to the eighth graders. Yes, so that this is, you know, something that is, that they've, they've found ways to communicate yes. that to young people. And again, like anything, you can bring it uh, to higher levels yeah. of depth. Yeah, and that needs to be done. And we need other ways to mediate it. We need, we need our uh, good literature. In other words, it's got to be transformed not just to teaching, but to literature, to drama, to what defines our understanding of male and female in the culture. Yeah. It needs yeah. to, it needs to not just be a teaching from a book, but uh, just uh, deeply embedded in the culture. You know, I, I, I've never read a single romance novel at the supermarket. I'm glad to hear that. I was worried about that, but no, no, now I've it's never, cleared up. I, okay. Never okay. interested. But I will never say but you did again. But something 
of that level of storytelling yeah. as well as great literature, all, all sorts of levels needs to present yes. theology of the yeah. body rather than... And that's you know, very Catholic. I mean, the Catholic thing was we mediate through statues, we mediate through stories, here's the stained glass, yeah. you know, here are, here are rituals, here Chaucer are holidays. Chaucer was a Catholic Chaucer and told Catholic. great stories. He told great stories. Some of them you don't want to read out loud, but uh, they, they are great stories. And, and I, I love that about the romance because, you know, if you don't write a good Catholic romance, guess what's going to happen? Somebody's going to write a bad one. Yep. And, and so you have the wrong view of things. What is the, the market's going to be taken over by what? Fifty Shades of Grey. That's bad. That's very bad. bad. That's, that's fact, when, bad. One of the things, I, when I hear, uh, especially of a wife suddenly leaving her husband and children for no apparent reason, mm. my first question is, did you read uh, Fifty Shades yeah. of Grey? Yeah. Most of the time I'm right. <laughs> Tragically. Let's now go over to George. George, where are you calling from? Hi, Father Mitch. I'm calling from a little city in upstate New York called Binghamton. Oh, sure. I've been through there. Yeah, you passed me on the highway. Ain't that yeah. something? <laughs> it's been a long time. I don't yeah. know if you were driving yet, George. But uh, <laughs> what was, what's your question tonight? I'd like to ask Dr. Weicker, is there, uh, do you think there may be a possibility that in the future on your show... Uh, you may do like, uh, I know you didn't talk about not having yelling and screaming, but do like maybe Dr. Yosef Mengler versus Maximilian Kolbe on the dignity of the human person, or Yosef Goebbels versus Maximilian Kolbe on the dignity of the person and the need for religion in the life. Wow. Um, this is amazing because we were actually talking about this today. We were, we, because there's, you know, we, and when we go on set, uh, we talk, okay, well, who do we do now? Who do we do now? And, uh, and, and St. Maximilian Colby is, a, is an obvious example. And we were talking about any of the, you know, you can't do Hitler because if you have a guy show up like Hitler, he's not going to look like Hitler. We don't want to do that. Yeah. You can say a teaching moment there. Guess what? There were other Nazis. It couldn't have been carried on without other very intelligent people at high levels mm -hmm. carrying these things out. So uh, anyone from Himmler to Goebbels, any of these folks would ha make a good candidate and allows us to teach the audience, too. Mm -hmm. You don't know, everyone hears about Hitler, what do you really know about him, but what about all these other people that were at the top um, and really gave it the brains uh, and, and allowed it to be such an, a horribly effective program? That's a good match. In yeah. fact, yeah, I'd be happy fact, to do that. Also, the commandant of Auschwitz camp was an interesting character as a contrast because yeah. he had been a seminarian, lost his faith, became a uh, soldier of fortune, came back and joined the Nazi party and went up into being. And so to have the contrast between the former seminarian and the man who stayed in the priesthood. Yes. Yeah. And then at the end of his life, that same commandant repented, he came back to his faith. And that would be an interesting... Okay, I'm sold. Yeah, that, that... Is, that, is that a good one? Can, will that, would that uh, fit your bill? Uh, he's he's off, now. okay, yeah, well, yeah, good. Yeah, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that as a yes. Yeah. <laughs> Silence is a sound. So that, but it might be even, you know, it might be... Goebbels and somebody like uh, Francis de Sales would be interesting. That would be good, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. Goebbels was in charge of propaganda, propaganda yeah. and uh, Francis de Sales was in yeah. charge, uh, is the patron saint of publishing. So yes. Can deal with some variety. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. Let's go to Catherine. Catherine, where are you calling from? Southern California. Well, aren't you something? What part of Southern California? You don't want to know. <laughs> Uh -oh. Near Hollywood. Well, I don't mind knowing that. I like it. It's pretty yeah, out there. Well, That's pretty. I am a convert at seven. I brought my family back into the church. My grandmother died at 102 from the church. And uh, oh, I was taught by Jesuits and Sisters of Charity and then Redemptress. Wow. So I've got it all skated. But I never heard about Margaret Sanger into college. And I'm thinking to myself, we don't hear about Abortion, nothing on the pulpit. So what is going on? Well, what don't do you hear about, think? Don't hear about what? I, yeah, she didn't, 
she's never heard this material about Margaret Sanger. Oh, yes. She doesn't hear much about abortion from the pulpit. Or contraception. Or contraception. Yes. So what's going on? Why, in other words, why don't we hear more about that particular scoundrel? We, we really do need to hear more about her. I can't, I'm championing her books because all you need to do is read her and you're horrified. But that makes you ask bigger questions about Planned Parenthood and what they're up to. So if this is the start of it, it can't end well. Mm -hmm. Every pe uh, priest should be reading this and know it because they are the biggest funded international organization carrying on all these things now. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, as part of the priest formation, they should be doing a kind of a saints versus scoundrels. So you know who is out there, <coughs> what does it mean, uh, what, what is uh, Margaret Sanger really up to? And that, in a way, helps us understand, well, why does the church argue uh, that, you know, for the illicitness of, of contraception and abortion? Well, look what happens if you take the opposite view. That's one way to find out what does it really mean to have the church's position. You take the opposite view. You follow yeah. out the ramifications of their thought. Here's your starting point thought, and you keep following to its logical conclusions, and you end up with Planned Parenthood being having 60% of its abortion clinics in African-American neighborhoods. Yes. And that in New York City, 85% of all black children conceived get aborted. That would seem to me... I would call that... I would call Black Lives Matter would be interested in that information, I, I would, would think. I would think so. I would think so, because if you think that all lives matter and black lives matter... That's a big, that's, that's a scandalous extermination rate. That's awful. Yeah, it, it, again, extermination rate and genocidal. Yeah, it's genocidal, the, the, yeah. You know, only 15% of the child, black children conceived in New York City survive? Yeah. That that's is a outrageous. Problem. That's right? a problem, yeah. So we talk about it here a lot, Catherine. We're doing our part. Yeah, we, we, we want to get, that's why we're doing these programs, and I've talked about it on Threshold and other programs over the years, so... Let's just keep trying to buy books and distribute them <laughs> about Mar Margaret Sanger's books. Yeah. We have Marianne on the line. Hello, Marianne. Hi, Father Paco. How are you? I'm well, thanks. And what's your question? Uh, I just have a brief question for your guest, uh, Benjamin Weicker. I'm just curious to know uh, who are some one or two of the saints who have been an influential and an inspirational experience on your life. And thank you so much, and God bless you both. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. So who are your favorite saints? Well, 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 well. Well, we did one of them, and that's St. Augustine. We had St. Augustine on with Rousseau, mm -hmm. uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and they are opposites. Oh, uh, yeah. They both did confessions. They both did an actual book called The Confessions, and, and Rousseau's book was the anti-Augustine Confessions. Yeah. So he was it's the... It's also boring. And icky. Yeah. Yes, and icky. I, I just don't want to know that much about him, and I find St. Augustine fascinating. So he's... He's obviously one of the, the most wonderful saints. And a lot of people don't know this, by the way. If we could have him walk on the set, he would be dark-skinned, kinky hair. He's a Berber from North Africa. He's our most influential theologian in the West, and we don't know that. He really is out of Africa. Yeah. So uh, he certainly is one. And probably the one that made a convert out of me was Thomas Aquinas. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know I was a convert when I was reading them. Mm -hmm. See, Thomas Aquinas, the saint, played his cards close to his chest. And so I was reading him and didn't know he would make me a Catholic, but he tricked me. So you get through the Summa and you think, okay, the problem is I believe all this stuff. I'm convinced. And you have no choice. You have to become a Catholic. I know. So he's to blame. I know. God bless. That's good. God bless St. Thomas. Well, those are two, good, two great choices, the two yeah. greatest minds of the history of the church. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's how can, and then, and then there's so many other ones. Yeah, but those, yeah. that's a good start. But we are also coming to a fast end. Oh, no. Yeah, we're getting close to the end of the show. So I want to urge you to get a copy of this TV series from EWTN called Saints vs. Scoundrels. That's also at EWTN's religious catalog, EWTNRC.com, or call 1-800-854-6316. And you can also go to ew10.com to find out the times for saints and scoundrels in your area. Ben, thank you so much for being here. And may the Lord bless all of you and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
And we can do saints and scoundrels. It's really a lot of work. They work extremely hard with the wonderful actors and do this program and everything else only because this network is brought to you by you. That's how Mother Angelica was inspired to set us up. So keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you.